it's been very good being completely isolated because the path I went down, I don't think I, if I had been distracted by anything, I might not have figured out a few interesting points in this whole prism affair. It was all a little too easy. You know what I mean? It's just, I felt the same way. Okay. It, it looked rigged. Yeah, a little rigged. And I'm like, I, I at least. And, and here's another thing. When you're doing these slides, why at the bottom of that of these slides it says top secret? <laughs> and let's and face I found it, that to be a little weird. Let's face it, they need some templates or something. The powerpoint is horrendous. If you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, generally speaking, especially to a larger group, <laughs> would you put all that crap at the bottom? I don't think so. I think that was just so, a so, distraction. So, okay, so this. you had the same feeling I had, and the journey really started for me with an interview on a podcast um uh oh i feel stupid now i forgot the name of the podcast well the the guy who was being interviewed is ray mcgovern and ray mcgovern was an analyst for the cia during the uh, kennedy administration and you know he's a blog and he he's a blogger now essentially he's retired and he's on the program because he wrote this article called Doubting Obama's Resolve to Do Right, uh, wherein he essentially calls the president a wuss. And I'll get to why he called him that in a moment. Um, so here's just, uh, like, I think 30 or 40 seconds of part of... Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. That was a weird sound. Huh. Uh, here is uh, part of what kind of got me on to... Uh, and this this is a, a uh, an anecdote that I found very interesting. And I know from a good friend who was there when it happened, that at a small dinner with progressive supporters, after these progressive supporters were banging on Obama before the election, why don't you do the things we thought you stood for? Obama turned sharply and said, don't you remember what happened to Martin Luther King Jr.? That's a quote, and that's a very revealing quote. The other thing is, I've always been kind of shocked that when he came into office, not only did he not prosecute the torturers, or the kidnappers, the people with the black prisons, or the, even the people who uh, violated our Fourth Amendment rights, he left them all in place. And, you know, I suspected at the time, and now I'm pretty convinced, the President of the United States is afraid of the CIA. I really like that, where he said the, the President of the United States is afraid of the CIA. And this makes sense. Um, in our general thesis that we... And we've been saying this for what? Yes. Well... Since the first election, since Obama first got elected, we knew right. there was a feud. Well, not just a feud, but even Ron Paul said a while... Actually, I looked for that clip. I couldn't find it where he said, look, the CIA is taking over. No, they're, they run, they're running the joint. Right. What? They took, they took it from you. <laughs> it's been scrubbed. <laughs> they scrubbed it. Now, scrubbed. In, in, in his article in this... Uh, and by the way, I have uh, an outline... Uh, for in the show notes, which is not just an outline, but also indented. And every, uh, this whole story I'm about to tell you, you can go and follow the steps and see if I went wrong or see if you like what I came up with. Uh, so you can do that after the fact, uh, 520.nashownotes.com. So in this article, he says the CIA is messing with Obama's head. And, and this is where he contradicts our initial theory and says the hecklers are put in place by the CIA to show Obama we can get to you at any time. And I'm like, wow, that's Well, we've very had this thesis, too. I think we there was a number of incidents where suddenly something crazy happened, which was that sort of thing. I, I can't remember the details, but, but we've spotted this, this trick a couple of times. But I, but this has, been hap this, ha this has been happening a lot in recent memory... Um, and so you take into account the president saying, hey, man, I don't want to be Martin Luther King. I don't want to get shot uh, and that he's afraid. And then the CIA possibly. And I th and I think it's more likely than it's scripted um, the way we talked on the last show. But we certainly have discussed. And I think it seems more likely this is a way of saying, oh, you know what? We can get anyone into anywhere. Oh, by the way, your wife. Here we go. There, there, we've got people right in front. So whatever you do, we got our eyes on you. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Now, how do I bring this into uh, into prison? First of all, the CIA runs everything. Now, the feuds, we, without doubt, have uh, identified and have played many different uh, anecdotes of people saying 
the CIA, they hate all the other intelligence agencies. I'm pretty sure that they would love to get one over on the NSA. So let's presume for a moment this may be an... The NSA has been uncooperative. Very uncooperative. We've noticed this. We've we re- re- reported this, I don't know, for years now, the NSA, is, and they're arrogant. Now, what if we could make the president look bad, at the same time distract everyone from the true bad actor in the cyber world, I'm not talking about phone calls, but in the cyber world, so that we could really continue our massive surveillance program without anyone, and of course, hiding it in plain sight, without anyone suspecting what we're doing because everyone's focused on something else. So let's, crap, I, I did it. Looking at um, what we know already, obviously, Google, I mean, are you kidding me? Uh, in 2010, uh, they had to admit, yes, we have the NSA Alliance program. I mean, this is, this is not like a secret. This has been out there for years. Uh, Google and the NSA have a department. They have a, part, a joint venture discussed in mainstream media even. Uh, the, court, um, the courts upheld the um, uh, Google's denial and the NSA's denial of uh, a Freedom of Information Act request that they could keep it secret. So, th- so this is this is new. Oh, and by the way, we do all remember that after 180 days, the government has the right to read your email anyway. I mean, this is th- th- did we forget this, this is all a, of a this sudden? This is the biggest joke there is. Right? Did we forget this all of a sudden that this has already been out there? And, and that, if your email is over 180 days and, old, and it's stored on on, a, on an email service. Any service, any any of them, the government can look at it without a warrant. Now let's look at, uh, let's just grab one. Let's look at uh, Facebook. So Facebook, we know that Facebook has one of their venture capital founding funders was InQtel, which is, uh, which is the intelligence agency's venture capital fund. And f- person of the year, 2010, Mark Zuckerberg, Time Magazine. Oh, how quickly we forget. I've pointed this out to a couple of my Obama bot friends who were like, how is this possible? I said, well, let's just read your leftist propaganda and the relevant uh, uh, paragraph from this article. From it was, And we talked about this on the show that no we one picks up on this. We talked about this numerous times. The door opened and a distinguished looking gray haired man burst in. It's the only way to describe his entrance, trailed by a couple of deputies. He was both the oldest person in the room by 20 years and the only one wearing a suit. He was in the building, he explained, with the delighted air of a man about to secure ironclad bragging rights forever, and he had just had to stop in to introduce himself to Zuckerberg. Robert Mueller, director of the FBI, pleased to meet you. Are you kidding me? Did, we, did, 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 did no one <laughs> I see love this? that paragraph. Yeah. Is it, so, yes, the FBI is in there. And that it was there. put in there for code. I mean, that, that was put in the article so everyone would, that was in whatever circle that was being transmitted to. Oh, okay. We're right. Good. We're good now. We, we're, we're in. What we're seeing is Silicon Valley freaking out now because, of course, they 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 cooperate. It's all part of the sharing program, and they're all good. And, and I, I truly believe, John, that they are, they've been taken off guard. They're like, whoa, wait a minute. You're accusing us of what? So they're all very careful with their little wording. We don't give you direct access and all this stuff. By the way, did you see Jeff Jarvis uh, uh, defending Google? No, <laughs> Jeff Jarvis is a Google stooge. You might as well just work for him. <laughs> but it was just, I, actually, I should, I should, he's like, I take Larry Page at his literal word. So in other words, whatever, whatever Larry said, Literally, I'm, I take him at his word, and then he talks about conspiratorial thinking about these companies. Oh, this can't be true. There's no gambling going on here. <laughs> okay. But I, I have a feeling, I have a feeling that, uh, that they were really taken off guard with this. Now, um, we look at this PowerPoint, and as we just discussed, you know, th- th- I mean, what kind of PowerPoint is this? What I found immediately interesting was to note that Apple was added to the so-called prison program six months after Steve Jobs died. And I've always heard... I noticed that, too. I've always heard that Steve Jobs... You know, this is a definitely conspiratorial uh, story, uh, that the uh, the government always wanted to backdoor into everything. Microsoft rolled over like like a bitch puppy. And, you know, and... Yes, but you don't even know to need a backdoor to break into Windows. I mean, you can just... It's so easy to to compromise it. 
But the jobs always said, no, I'm not going to let you into my system. And that sounds like him. We'll get back to right. jobs and later. In fact, I know that there was probably some struggle at Microsoft. I don't think they rolled over that quickly because here's the problem with uh, with a lot with having that NSA dot dat or whatever. You know, there was these little pieces of code that were floating around yeah. the uh, Windows uh, <laughs> the DLL uh, system or what the registry yeah, or whatever. There. Yeah, is that you ruin foreign sales? I mean, you can't take <laughs> no. this product yes, correct. into France or Germany. And expect anyone to use it if it's just a if it's just a, uh, a Trojan horse as a whole right. for the uh, NSA. And there's it's just not possible. And there's all you these can't. stories about you know an, an Israeli back end and all these things. But I have heard many many times Steve Jobs won't allow that to happen. And so I found it interesting. We'll get back to the Apple thing, but I noticed wow. So Apple well, jumps and then on. What happened to Steve Jobs? Well, I'll get back to that. He's dead. So Apple jumps on board. So you the think pr- they killed him? Would you let me get to my story? There's so much more to talk about. I mean, if that would be the, the conclusion of the story, which it is, that would be sad. There's a lot more to talk about. So, um, so the, the, the leaks come out through a guy named Glenn Greenwald. You have to go back to the source. No one is questioning this. Very disturbing to me. Who is Glenn Greenwald? Of course, well, Glenn, I, I, <clears throat> the, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald is an outstanding columnist who's a total lefty. I do follow him. He used to be with Salon Magazine, and he's kind of a he's, – he's one of those progressive progressives that's gone beyond being an Obama bot and is nothing but critical of the president. And then Correct. somehow – I don't know how this even hooks up with him, but he's the one who rolled it out in The Guardian. Well, he got nothing but positive there you go. Tweets. Okay. Well, There's you- something fishy about how this – uh, what the progress was, and I'm, I'm guessing you're going to tell me. Yes, that is correct, John. <laughs> That's where I started. Uh, so I, here's what I learned briefly about Glenn Greenwald. He's a former lawyer. Uh, he was a civil rights lawyer, and many people have said some nasty things about his work uh, as a civil rights lawyer, but I don't think that is important. He lives in Brazil with his uh, boyfriend, and he worked at Salon Magazine since 2007, before a, I would say, a high-profile move to Guardian USA less than a year ago. So, so, God damn it, I keep saying so. To me, very interesting to see Glenn's move to the Guardian, and here he is, the biggest story of, uh, of the century, really, for him. As you say, he's so left that he really is, I would say he almost hates the president, Uh, And part of his reasoning for not liking the president for many years was the Defense of Marriage Act. Um, And, you know, he's gay, so he's in Brazil. It's like, I can't live in America because America's all effed up, and so I'm living in Brazil. So he's been very, very critical uh, of all that. But more importantly, he loves Petraeus. And I went back uh, to... What? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, let me put it this way. He defended... What happened to Petraeus? So Petraeus, as you remember, as you recall, was director of the CIA, and John Brennan, who our friend um, McGovern says, McGovern says, President Obama brought Brennan in because he's so afraid of the CIA. He thought, I have I have loyalty from Brennan, so they won't try to kill me because Brennan's running the show. Remember, this is a you know Brennan is appointed by the president. So the president was so afraid of the CIA, he said, Brennan, and also he said, let's get the drones out of the CIA before they drone me or whatever. Um, and so Brennan was brought in. Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, f- f- public fights. If you go back and read his columns, which apparently you follow him, he was like, Brennan is the worst guy ever. You can't have him in. And on Petraeus, I just have a, a little clip here from Democracy Now!, Instead of saying, yeah, well, Petraeus is a douchebag, elitist douchebag, no, he immediately goes and bitches about the FBI. I think there's a lot of media focus on the salacious aspects of this case for reasons um, that are obvious, which is that the media loves sex scandals. Um, but there are real issues arising from this of, of genuine importance and substance, beginning with the fact that the FBI, based on really no evidence of any actual 
actual crime, engaged in this massive surveillance effort of first obtaining all kinds of intimate and private information about two women, one of whom complained, one of whom was the target of the complaint, Paula Broadwell and Jill Kelly, um, learned the locations and email accounts of Paula Broadwell, who was the subject of this um, fairly innocuous complaint, read through all of her emails, learned the identity of her anonymous lover, David Petraeus, um, likely read, certainly read through all of her emails, probably read through his, um, and then in the process as well, um, learned about an affair between the complainant, Jill Kelly, or not an affair, but inappropriate communications, as they're calling it, and the four-star general in Afghanistan, uh, General Allen, and then obtained 20 to 30,000 pages of emails between them as well. So you're talking about a massively invasive investigation um, without any of their knowledge, obtaining their most private and intimate communications, all without evidence of any predicate crime, um, really without uh, the need, except in a few cases, for judicial review or oversight. And to me, it really illustrates how how invasive and sprawling this unaccountable surveillance state has become. This happens all the time, just generally to people less powerful and influential than the two generals in question here. And so we can really learn lessons, um, I hope, about what we've allowed the government to do in, in terms of its investigative powers. Instead of saying, well, wow, this is really not okay, what the CIA director was doing, the title of his article, that's why he was invited onto Democracy Now!, was FBI's abuse of the surveillance state is the real scandal here. Uh, regarding John Brennan being picked as CIA chief, uh, he wrote, Brennan's appointment is crossing multiple lines that no Obama supporter should sanction. So he was very much against that, very much. Uh, so I, I believe that he is possibly uh, compromised, uh, and that's not the first time you'd hear about the CIA using people in the press or yeah, writing stories a lot of for them. Work for the CIA in so the I'm press. like, okay, maybe, maybe this is, you know, maybe possibly. there's something to this. Now, um, so Glenn Greenwald, now we have friends, by the way, inside uh, all the alphabet letter agencies. Uh, we have NSA challenge coins. You know, but I have never received anything as cool as this. I mean, this. I mean, getting a PowerPoint like that. I mean, that's that's. I mean, I mean, wow. I mean, we don't get past the gift shop. But Glenn Greenwald in the New York Times says the leak came from quote a reader of mine who was comfortable working with me. The source, Mr. Greenwald said, quote knew the views that I had and had an expectation of how I would display them. I'm thinking, really. Is that simple? Just, I mean, you're telling me that that we have all these people inside the NSA uh, and and other agencies, and but th but your source gets a hold of this PowerPoint. So I'm thinking this is either bullcrap, or it's much higher up than we could ever be, or oh, maybe, yeah. or perhaps maybe it's a little combination. So now I'm going to look into Mr. Greenwald's history as a journalist. So he's a journalist. He started out at Salon Magazine, where he became a blogger. Now, Salon Magazine is very interesting. Uh, it is a publicly listed company, so there's all kinds of information uh, available about them. Current stock price of Salon Magazine, the Salon Media Publishing Empire, is 11 cents a share, John. Yeah, I know. Uh, good they, deal. They lose a million dollars a year, have never been profitable, ever. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. Who is uh, funding this outfit? Considering ah. you, by the way, that's kind of interesting when you consider all these other little startups that have come and gone tech crunch and all these other guys that get bought for millions of dollars and get incorporated into AOL and other things. Salon has always been, never been uh, up for grabs. I find that actually peculiar, but go on. They, well, I, coming from a, uh, a corporate a hole shill background, I also, particularly when it comes to funding companies, I also was like, well, how does something continue to exist? They've got to have some sugar daddy, someone who is paying for this. And if they're paying for it, then there's a reason for that as well. So there must be some, there's got to be something behind this. Uh, so it has been unprofitable throughout its entire history, all this public knowledge. Um, but since 2007, two board members, including the chairman of the board, have been funding the company with approximately three to four million dollars a year. These two gentlemen are John Warnock and William Hambrecht. Would you? Are you familiar with these names, John? 
I know these guys. Yes. William Hambrecht is, of course, uh, one of the founders of uh, one of the largest Silicon Valley uh, venture capital companies. And John Warnock is uh, the CEO, I believe, of Adobe. Chairman. Chairman. Chairman Chairman of Adobe. Uh, And and all this information is in the the show notes. And Bill Hambrick's daughter, I might point out, is the president of Salon Magazine. So, you know, that's a good hire right there. So if you think about for a second, all of the companies that were mentioned in the PRISM document, all the companies that could compromise data that's centrally located, what is the one company that really is inside the CIA and the NSA and the FBI that has its products used every single day? That is Adobe. And that is primarily Adobe with their uh, reader, Acrobat. And when uh, they have this thing called F-Secure, which is to uh, redact uh, PDF files, PDF files, there's, so, there's such a black box uh, 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 the PDF by itself. But let's, of course, look at uh, what we all think of uh, outside of you know, the creative suite of Adobe. We always think about Flash. Let's go back to the dead man talking to me. The dead man being Steve Jobs who refused to put Flash into iOS. And he wrote a letter uh, in 2000... This was not long before. It was uh, 2010, I think, or 11. He wrote a letter called His Thoughts on Flash, and he outlined a number of reasons why he didn't want Adobe in iOS. Third, there's reliability, security, and performance. Symantec recently highlighted Flash for having one of the worst security records in 2009. We also know firsthand that Flash is the number one reason Macs crash. We've been working with Adobe to fix these problems, but have persisted for several years, and we don't want to reduce the reliability and security of our iPhones, iPods, and iPads by adding Flash. And if you read now, headline from the register from uh, June 9th, that would be today, maybe it was yesterday, maybe it was the 8th that this came out, Uh, Steve Jobs' death clears way for Adobe CTO defection. The CTO of Adobe has just left to join Apple, and there is some question uh, whether maybe Flash will come to the iPhone, which I'll get to in just a moment. Now, we know that Flash has been doing, it has been a security risk, there's been exploits, uh, it, it, you know, it's been accused of phoning home. It's also on every single computing device, pretty much except for the iOS platform. It truly, most guys who are, are who are uh, security conscious that I know, uh, sysadmins won't run it. They refuse. Like, oh, I can't watch that video. Which is why Steve Jobs, I believe, said no flash. Uh, that thing's a mess. But maybe he knew a little bit more. Maybe he knew that that really what flash is is. It really is a true spying mechanism. It can access your camera, your microphone. It can do all kinds of things. Flash cookies are really very persistent, very hard to get rid of. And who uses these things? The advertising world. So I'm thinking to myself, if Adobe truly were evil and Adobe wants to get this document out and make all the competitors look like horrible people so they can go on their merry way and really aggregate the data of the people, not go in and sift it, but but really get the data directly right off your computer, which can be keystrokes for all I know. It could be anything. Flash is very, very sophisticated, but it's a black box. We are not, we can't look inside of all of it. Of course, you can't have Flash just dialing home. People would catch on to that. But what is the one thing in this entire conversation that everyone just dismisses offhand well, advertising networks track you. Yeah, well, I guess it's a good trade-off. <laughs> Why wouldn't um, Adobe acquire an advertising network? Well, as it turns out, Adobe acquired something better, which is a company which was uh, funded by uh, our friend uh, Warnock's buddy, uh, William, Omniture. Omniture, which they bought for $3 billion dollars, Omniture is the statistics system of the advertising industry. And Omniture is a company that was started by a guy called Josh James in Utah as a part of the Church of Latter-day Saints, i.e. the Mormons who have the largest database of human beings on the universe, or in the universe. 
what I'm seeing is I'm seeing Adobe is the true bad actor. And how many times do they upgrade their flash and it's still sucking and it's crashing? And they have Omniture embedded. And they're not hiding anything. They're tracking you. Oh, and you and most people go, oh, well, you know, it's, it's just advertising, obviously, you know, whatever. We don't really know what the data is that's being sent back. But it's there. It's open. It's free and clear. Omniture tracking. And people say it's just advertising. It's not the government. No, I think this is by far worse. And this now makes sense to me that Steve Jobs knew that these guys were up to no good and he didn't want any part of it. Now, of course, none of this would make sense unless you could also really put this on all iOS devices. And here's where I think Apple is now on board with the program. We've got Tim Cook, who probably doesn't have the same scruples as Steve Jobs. And you need to know that Adobe acquired a video ad platform called uh, Auditude. They were, uh, just recently, $120 million acquisition, and they, and, and they immediately uh, turned this around, and you can't um, buy ads with them, uh, not as far as I can tell from their website, but they've turned this into Adobe Primetime. It's called Project Primetime. It's a video platform, and it will now come to iOS. It will work on everything. This is what the CTO guy is coming to do, and it essentially has flash built into it. And they they were at NAB making deals with every single broadcaster, and they will become the streaming video provider of choice because they're going to give it all away. And now they have successfully put in the true, true spying mechanism into every single computing device on the planet, sucking that data out right in plain sight, going back into the databases, and they have huge data centers through Omniture, and that's, that's the company that you need to be afraid of. And that's the company that the CIA, maybe the NSA, but I think these guys, they'll sell it to anybody. We know the Mormons, they sell their database to Ancestry.com. It's, you know, it's, they're just selling it. So there's nothing sneaky, and that's why Google and Yahoo and Microsoft are like, what? 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 They were taken off guard. Because they have no idea what's happening. But these guys, these guys, directly tied into Glenn Greenwald, directly, they are the ones that are behind this. Well, a couple of things. It's, I like the way you piece this together. You'll be getting a call from Glenn Beck. Because uh, you, 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 you threw a lot of stuff into one thesis that looks like it makes sense. Except a couple of little items. One... The uh, these companies that you say were caught off guard, it was curious that they all had pretty much the exact same wordage to their denials. Uh, and I don't think they all called each other, say, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? That doesn't detract from what's no, happening. I'm not saying that, but it's, I don't think they were as caught off as much guard as you, as you might imagine. Yeah, but I mean, to call I, me Glenn Beck is a huge insult after I'm I did sorry. all that work. I, did, I didn't call you Glenn Beck. I said he'd be calling you. Oh. Well, you, I guess you were saying that I, I did it like Glenn Beck or something, which is insulting, too. That's not meant to be. Okay. Um, I play the weasel words for data capture, and I, I think there's a couple of little things in there that I would at least want to bounce off. The U.S. National Security Agency and the FBI are tapping directly into the central servers of nine leading U.S. Internet companies. That's according to a report in the Washington Post. It comes in the back of Britain's Guardian newspaper, claiming Washington is collecting telephone records of millions of Americans. Google, Apple, Yahoo and Facebook have in statements denied the government had direct access to their central servers. Microsoft said it does not voluntarily take part in any government data collection. I'd like to say two things. One, be reminded The Guardian was in direct cahoots with WikiLeaks, but not like they took WikiLeaks and published it in their newspaper. No, we now know and it's been published everywhere, that The Guardian would then call up the State Department and say, hey, we're going to publish this. Is that okay? Well, no. Could you take that out? Could you take that out? Okay. Yeah, right. So the yeah. New York Times. Right. And But if you truly, if you want to really, instead of having to go, yes, of course, of course this is taking place with these companies. But if you really want to have the information of everybody, it's a pain. No, I'm it's not going to argue this. I, 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 what I wanted to point out is Microsoft's comment, which was now has been lost to, to the history, but uh, where they said they don't voluntarily do anything, which means that I think that there's some other program in place which is forcing them to do stuff. 
since they use the word volunteer, uh, meaning they don't wrap up Correct. the date and Correct. send it in. But, on but the this date. is but this is this is the point that you made earlier. This is not news. We know that they're doing this. We know that this has been going on. We know that the FBI is in, in Facebook. We know that the NSA is in Google. But this is all peanuts. That's my point. It's peanuts, and it's distracting from what's really going on right in front of our noses. I wish they would get rid of Flash. Flash, when I was doing the X3 show, Joe Engel went on to a rant about how Flash w- – and talk about the the cookies you can't get rid of. Mm-hmm. It does all kinds of stuff you can't get rid of. There's nothing you can do when when you get a whatever it is that they that you might get planted through Flash. It's impossible to get it off your machine. And Steve Jobs knew this. He knew they were up to no good. He had a, pen, a very famous for hating a lot of these kinds of people. Really getting into big feuds with guys exactly like this, exactly like this. And I think for these reasons, and how many truly elite superstar, super rich people do we know that still die of cancer today? Not a lot. If you look at the cancer rate amongst the citizens, how many, would, besides Steve Jobs, who else of super elite status way up there in the echelons has died of cancer in recent memory? Yeah. There's, there's Hugo Chavez, guy. another enemy of the state. Give me another yeah. one. Exactly. Well, they would all be enemies of the state. Yes. Well, Steve um, Jobs was an enemy of the state. So, but I think I think you've got an interesting thesis, and I like it. But I, it doesn't detract from way, my way to back red book prediction. <laughs> way to backpedal, dude. <laughs> it doesn't detract from my prediction some weeks back that once they got these scandals going, they were going to pile on to get rid of Obama. And I think that this, you can't ignore that this is part of that. Well, we also, uh, in this, uh, it, uh, it's funny, did we not play that? Did we not play where the president said that he would probably, uh, he, he might be gone by the next three and a half years? Did we play that piece? No, you didn't play it. You have it? <laughs> yes. I have, it's at the end of this clip, I think. I mean, and people check. can't trust not only the executive branch, yeah, it's at the but end also of this clip. don't on. trust the privacy issues. I will leave this office at some point, sometime in the last next three and a half years. <laughs> maybe earlier. I don't know. <laughs> Could be sometime. Maybe next year. Maybe next month. 